Okay, the golden age of Tudor England, the age of Queen Elizabeth I. Queen Elizabeth. Throughout this presentation, you will find that occasionally people are winking. Can you get the names of everybody who winks? There's a little challenge for you. So, Elizabeth's childhood. Not a particularly happy childhood as it happens because her mother was beheaded when she was less than three years old and she was then declared to be illegitimate. However, there were people around her, her governesses and attendants, um, Margaret R Bryan, uh, Blanche Parry, Catherine Champanone, these people made sure that she wasn't totally ne neglected and put some pressure on Henry VIII, Elizabeth's father, to make sure that she was looked after at least uh, reasonably well. And she got a very, very good education. She learned French, Flemish, Italian and Spanish at a very young age. By the time she was 11, she was under the tutelage of William Grindle and a few years later of Roger Ascham, who was one of the most famous educators of his age. And she was known as one of the most intelligent and best educated women in Europe. At the age of 11, she translated from the French the mirror or glass of the sinful soul and presented it in an embroidered cover to Catherine Parr. It is generally supposed that she embroidered the cover as well as translating the book at the age of 11. Well, her childhood achievements make me feel pretty inadequate. Her traumas were beyond belief. In addition to the fact that her mother died when she was two years and eight months old and she'd never be able to remember a time before that, really, everything she knew in her life, the first thing was that her mother had been killed because her father had ordered her to have her head chopped off. That's pretty traumatic. As if that wasn't bad enough, when she was eight years old, her father beheaded another woman that he was married to. This would have brought it all back to Elizabeth. The same thing happening again when she was just that bit older and she was able to understand that much better what was actually going on. And then uh, after her death, she was living with the widow, sorry, after the death of Henry, Elizabeth was living with the widow that's um, Catherine Parr, Henry's sixth wife, and she and her new husband took Elizabeth in, and it seems that Catherine Parr's new husband, Thomas Seymour, then abused her sexually. <clears throat> There's some dispute about that. He claimed it was all good fun, but I doubt that she thought it was fun. So she had a pretty rotten time. And when one tries to calculate the reasons why she never married, there were political reasons why she never married, but ah, quite possibly, quite likely, these experiences had a profound effect on her and very probably influenced her decision never to marry in later life. It wasn't all doom and gloom. There were some positive things that happened, among them the fact that she had a good relationship with her sister Mary and her half-brother was born in 1537 and she and the little boy got on very nicely, by all accounts. So she had some of the normal aspects of a childhood, along with some very, very abnormal aspects. Elizabeth's life 
was filled with danger, especially after her mother-in-law, Catherine Parr, died. Catherine was a powerful protector for Elizabeth as long as she lived, but after that she was in danger from a number of directions, one of the worst being Catherine's own husband, Thomas Seymour, the one who had perhaps, or pro quite probably, abused Elizabeth. He now seemed to think that he was in with a chance of actually marrying Elizabeth. Well, at the same time as having those designs on Elizabeth, he got involved in a plot to replace his brother, who was the protector of the young boy king, Edward VI, that is, Elizabeth's half-brother. Well, Thomas Seymour was caught and the plot was foiled and he was put to death in 1549. Elizabeth was suspected of having some involvement in that, but she was careful, she was cautious, and nothing could be proved against her. This was a quality that she seemed to have in a number of different situations that went against her at that time. She was suspected of being involved in a plot against Mary in 1554, and again there was no proof. She managed to keep her uh, image clean enough to save her head. Quite literally, Mary would have had her head chopped off if she had been able to prove that she was involved in that plot. Even so, she ended up, for a period of time, being imprisoned in the Tower of London. She survived those years by being very careful and by pretending, more or less, to accept the demands that Mary put upon her, in particularly that she declare herself to be a Catholic. We know that she wasn't, in her heart, a Catholic, and when she had the chance, she reformed the church in a Protestant direction. While she was in the Tower of London, she wrote the following verse inside her prayer book. It says, No crooked leg, no bleared eye, no part deformed out of kind, nor yet so ugly half can be, is is the inward suspicious mind. Nothing is as ugly as a suspicious mind, and that would seem to be directed against Mary. Well, she wrote that secretly in her prayer book while she was being imprisoned by Mary in the Tower of London. Finally, though, Mary died, and now it was Elizabeth's turn to accede to the throne of England. Because Mary didn't have a child, there were two possibilities for her successor. One would be Mary Stuart, that was Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic, and she was the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister, who had married uh, James IV of Scotland. The other candidate, of course, was Elizabeth herself. Well, we know what happened, don't we? Elizabeth became queen. The Catholics wanted Mary as their champion, their queen, and Elizabeth was the champion of the Protestants. Well, Mary was only 17. She was in France. She spent most of her life in France, in fact. And at that time, it happened that Scotland was moving more in a Protestant direction, so uh, it had closer ties with England, and France was being um, a little bit left out of the picture. Also, France was going through um, a Protestant uprising, which was taking a lot of its energy, and basically what happened was that there wasn't enough support coming from France, and the Scottish Catholics were weakened, somewhat at that stage, and so Mary didn't get the backup that she needed to support her claim for the throne, 
and Elizabeth became queen. Here she is, the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. She was the main rival and in the end Mary became uh, a prisoner of Elizabeth's and was beheaded by her, although that didn't happen for many years. And uh, yes, if you're watching closely, there you go. So Elizabeth's rule is often considered as a, a kind of golden age in English history. It also established some of the basic norms of English society from that time on. The first thing she did was to make a, a very famous settlement that consolidated her position as Queen and also established the Church of England as a Protestant church. And she became Queen after Mary, that's Bloody Mary, so-called Bloody Mary, the Catherine Queen, not to be confused with Mary Queen of Scots, after um, Mary <laughs> first, Mary, Mary Tudor, died and she was crowned the following year. Apparently it was a very, very popular choice and she was warmly received by the English people. And as I say, she needed to establish herself to make her position strong. And she did this through the Act of Supremacy, which meant that anyone holding a public position had to accept that Elizabeth was not only the Queen, but was also the head of the Church. And then came the Act of Uniformity, which established the uh, procedures of the Church, in particular the prayers that were to be said in the Church. And these two acts, which were initially proposed in 1588, when she was first declared to be Queen, and which became law the following year, these two acts are called the Elizabethan Settlement. We can see Elizabeth here presiding over her government. It's pretty clear that she took an active part. She was not somebody's puppet. She was nobody's puppet. She was right there on the throne telling everybody else what they had to do. Pretty much. That's not to say that she didn't have advisers. She did. And we can see people around her here in the position of advisor, in the position of hmm, helping her towards reaching the decisions that she finally made, but it was always her decision. Which may also, of course, have affected her decision about whether to marry. Before I go on to the question of marriage, I'd like to take a look at the church at that time. With Elizabeth as the queen, the distinction was made between heretics, people who had beliefs that were different from the accepted beliefs, beliefs of the time, and uh, traitors. So basically, under Mary, people were put to death because they were considered to be heretics. They believed something that was different from the accepted teaching of the church, which for Mary was the Catholic teaching. Elizabeth, on the other hand, said, no, you can't really change what pe people believe in their hearts. As long as they are loyal to England and loyal to me, Elizabeth, as the Queen, I won't punish them. And so people were punished in theory at least, not for heresy, not for their beliefs, but for treason, that is to say for their actions, for the things that they did against the Queen or against the country. And all through Elizabeth's reign, the Church was trying to attract people from both the Protestant extreme side, that is from the Puritans, 
and from the Catholic side, so that it is famous for its so-called middle way via media between Catholicism and Puritanism. We get Richard Hooker writing a, a volume of eight, a work of eight volumes, four of which were published in his lifetime, and the other four uh, later on. We have Richard Hooker and his mm, the definitive statement, really. I mean, he def he he laid down what the a Kokukyokai, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, really was. He expressed its theology and its beliefs in a way that is still the accepted understanding of the Church even today. Okay, so Back to that question of marriage. When Elizabeth first came to the throne, it was widely supposed that she would marry. And the main question was, well, who? Who is she going to get married to? There were several possibilities. The Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, was her childhood sweetheart, really. But there was some scandalous gossip, gossip surrounding him. His first wife uh, fell downstairs, so they say, but the gossip was that she was pushed. So there was quite a lot of opposition to the idea that Elizabeth might marry uh, Dudley. They stayed friends all through his life. He died before she did, but there was no question after a certain time of them actually marrying. And there were various kings and princes uh, from other countries, Philip of Spain, who of course had been married previously to Mary. That's Mary Tudor, the Elizabeth's half-sister. Uh, Eric of Sweden, uh, the Archduke Charles of Austria, and uh, so on, Henry and Francis, the Dukes of Anjou. So these were all possible suitors and Elizabeth seemed to play a game for a number of years of playing them off against each other and leading them on in a certain way, uh, giving them to understand that perhaps, perhaps she might marry one of them. And of course, that helped to keep the peace with other countries during those years, because as long as there was a possibility of marrying the Queen of England, that was a better prospect than attacking England with an army or a navy. Here's Robert Dudley. He had been locked up in the Tower of London at the same time as the young Elizabeth and they remained close friends for all their lives. But she never married him. And internationally, Philip of Spain played an important role because there was uh, the hope on his part that she might marry him. Well, in the fact, in the end, in fact, she never married. She was known popularly as the Virgin Queen, although uh, it's pretty certain that she wasn't actually a virgin. She simply didn't actually get married. OK, so now back to Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was to prove a big problem to Elizabeth over a long period of time. And she has a very interesting story in her own right. She'd been made Queen of Scotland in 1542 when she was just a week old and she'd been promised in marriage when she was only six months old to Henry VIII's son, that's Edward. But pro-Catholic forces in Scotland broke that match, and Scotland went back to its association with France, the so-called Old Alliance, and 
in the end, Mary spent much of her childhood in France. And Henry was very angry with Scotland, and a big war ended up as the result. So uh, even as a tiny child, she had a very, very uh, extraordinary life. She was queen within a week and promised to be married within six months, and people were fighting wars over her within uh, a few years. Well, she did actually marry at the age of 15. She married Prince Francis of, of France, and he became king uh, the year after that. And then one year again after he became king, he died, and she was left a widow. She decided that she would go back to Scotland at this time, which was quite a dangerous move because she was Catholic and, as we said, Scotland was moving towards Protestant reform through uh, John Knox, the Protestant reformer who con con in engineered the transition from Catholicism uh, to Protestantism in Scotland. Nevertheless, she decided that she would return to Scotland. And, of course, she was the Queen, even though she had been living in France for all those years. Well, she got to Scotland and found herself involved with another man. This time it was her cousin, Henry Stuart, also known as Lord Darley. Well, this is a complicated story, and I can't go into all the details, but basically Darnley was jealous of Mary's private secretary. He thought that perhaps Mary had some kind of flirtation or uh, sexual interest in him, or that there was something going on between them. For that, or perhaps for, not for other reasons, but probably for that reason, he killed uh, David uh, Rizzio, the Italian secretary of Mary. And the next move was that Darnley himself was murdered. And shortly after that, in 1567, Mary married the man who was accused of murdering her second husband, Darnley. Okay, so <laughs> Darnley, Darnley murders her sec... Darn, 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 let's get it right straight. Darn, Darnley, first of all, marries her, then he murders her secretary, then he himself gets murdered, and she marries the man who probably murdered her, her husband, which was pretty unpopular. Um, apart from anything else, the man that she married, Hepburn, uh, Duke Earl of Bothwell, had got divorced in order to marry her, so all the Catholics in Scotland were against it. But anyway, everybody was against the idea that he was going to marry the woman whose uh, husband he had very probably killed. In other words, that he was going to marry Mary. So this led to Mary being forced to abdicate. She had to leave the throne. She had to lose her position as queen. And she was able to escape at that time from Scotland. And she went to England, leaving the throne of Scotland to her one-year-old son, who was her child with Darnley. That's the second husband, Henry Stuart. Uh, he was going to become the next king of Scotland. He would be James VI. And she left him behind and went to England, hoping that Elizabeth, remember Elizabeth, her cousin, the Queen of England, hoping that Elizabeth was going to uh, protect her and even uh, help her to get her position back as Queen of Scotland. Isn't that an amazing story? Seriously, you could not make this stuff up. I, I just can't imagine how somebody could have a life like that. It makes me feel that my life has been very boring. And it gets better. I mean, better. Not better for Mary. But as a story, uh, it, it carries on being pretty amazing. It, it uh, didn't end up very happily for Mary because she got her head chopped off. But 
When she got to England, Elizabeth was pretty worried about the whole situation. She wanted to know really what, what, what exactly was going on with this guy Darnley and, and this marriage that you had to the man who maybe murdered Darnley. She was pretty worried about that. And she was also very worried, perhaps most of all worried, about the risk that Mary presented to Elizabeth in her position as queen. You see, as long as Elizabeth was uh, queen of England as a Protestant, the Catholics were going to want to replace her with a Catholic queen. And of course, Mary was the queen of choice. She was the closest relative. She had the best claim to the throne. In fact, really, apart from Mary, there wasn't anyone much else that the Catholics could choose as a champion for the throne of England. So as long as Mary was alive, the Catholics would be trying to replace Elizabeth and have Mary as their queen. So it was pretty dangerous for, Mary, for Elizabeth and she could not let Mary go free at this stage. She, she doesn't seem to have been particularly nasty as such. She, she didn't really throw Mary into some dirty dark prison. Mary had oh, at least 16 servants during most of her period of confinement and she was allowed to travel to nearby villages um, she was kept in a place in the countryside with a, a, a rich family and she was pretty well looked after. The only restriction was that she was not allowed to move outside that area. She was not allowed to have contacts with uh, people who could be dangerous to Elizabeth. And that went on for a long time. But uh, in the end, there was another Catholic plot, one of many, one of perhaps about 20 during that period, plots to replace Elizabeth and put a Catholic queen in her position as Queen of England. And in one of those cases, some nearly 20 years after Mary had come to England, in one of those cases, Mary was found to have been in some sort of communication with the Catholic plotters. So she was seen to be, with, I'm not sure exactly how much truth there is in this, but she was seen to be actively involved in encouraging Catholics to kill Elizabeth and replace her with Mary as the Queen. And this, of course, was too much for Elizabeth, who had her put to death and she had her head chopped off in uh, 1587. There she is with her head on a silver platter. The gruesome details, the executioner possibly was drunk. He missed her neck on the first stroke, hit her on the back of the head and killed her on the second stroke. Um, even then the head didn't fall off completely and it wasn't until the third stroke that the head was completely separated from the body. Yeah. And then when he held up her head, her hair fell away and was seen to be a wig, which was a great shock given that she was supposed to be one of the most beautiful women in Europe. Actually, she did have hair. It was just that it was very short, cropped against her head. And the long hair that she seemed to have was actually a wig. So, this was a turning point because it led effectively to England having uh, a, a quite a long period of war against Spain. And King Philip, you remember he had proposed to her and she had said no. He had been the husband of her uh, half-sister Mary, but it didn't make any difference to Elizabeth. She was not going to marry him. But he was patient. He hung on in there. He was even patient when the so-called uh, heroes for the English, uh, people like Sir Francis Drake, the naval heroes, the naval commanders, considered heroes by the English, but recognised as pirates by the Spanish. Uh, he was even patient when they attacked his ships and plundered the gold and the other treasures that those ships were 
carrying on their return from the Americas, from the New World. He was even patient when Elizabeth made a pact allying herself with the Protestant rebels in the Netherlands, which were at that time under Spanish control. This was pretty much an act of war against Spain, because she's supporting Protestant rebels against the Spanish. Uh, part of the reason that he was moderately patient is that she wasn't very good at it. At least she didn't give the full support that would have made it possible for the Protestants to succeed. She's, either she didn't really understand what was needed or she hesitated to give the necessary full support. So it wasn't really until after Mary had been beheaded that Philip of Spain finally decided, OK, there's nothing else to do here. There's not going to be a Catholic queen on the throne of England. There's no chance that Elizabeth is going to marry me and that I can get some control of England in that way. In addition, her ships are attacking my uh, ships that are coming back from the Americas. She's calling them heroes. Uh, I'm calling them pirates and she's supporting the Protestant rebels in the Netherlands. So he prepared a massive attack on England. And that attack took place in 1588. The so-called invincible, unbeatable Spanish Armada set forth and sailed towards England. It is said that Sir Francis Drake, the so-called pirate by the uh, Spanish and the so-called hero for the English, it is said that Francis Drake was playing the old game of bowls at the time and insisted on finishing his game in gentlemanly fashion before setting out to fight against the Spanish navy, the invincible Armada. And beyond all belief, really, Spain lost. Spain had this huge fleet of ships attacking England, and yet somehow they lost. One reason was because a storm came up. This is probably actually <laughs> had more to do with it than the uh, ability of the English. A storm blew up and sent many of the ships off course, so that uh, actually there are people in Ireland today who have a, a Spanish a Spanish surname. And uh, de Valera, for example, was a, the Prime Minister of uh, Ireland, and uh, he, he had a, a, Spanish, a Spanish name. And that many of those Spanish names go back to the Spanish Armada, where the ships were blown off course, and the sailors married local Irish women and spent the rest of their lives in, in, in Ireland. It, it also needs to be said that the English had developed smaller ships which were able to move around and uh, much more quickly attack and then move away, uh, change position, whereas the Spanish ships, being much bigger, could not change direction very easily. So whatever the reason, for one cause or another, the Invincible Armada was actually beaten by a much weaker country. England at that time was not a particularly important country and was supposedly much weaker than Spain. The war continued and England had some bad moments in that war, but Basically, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, slowly but surely, Spain's power was declining and England's power was becoming stronger. So over the next, if you look at it over the next 50 years or 100 years or a couple of hundred years, it's very clear that Spain is in a kind of decline. Its power is being reduced and it's becoming weaker, whereas England is becoming stronger. 
Okay, so on to the last years of Queen Elizabeth's rule. Not terribly happy years, really. There was a lot of war, there were problems at home, and Elizabeth herself suffered a lot of personal sadness. The relationship with Spain had been getting worse and worse, and the war actually continued until after Elizabeth's death. She died in 1603, and peace was not made until the following year. And after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, that's 15... The Armada was in 1588, so in 1589, Elizabeth sent support to uh, the Protestant King of France. And similarly to her support for the Protestant rebels in the Netherlands, she didn't really give all the necessary resources to her soldiers. It's said that um, there were times when soldiers uh, were dying of starvation because she hadn't sent enough food for them, this kind of thing. And also, it must be noted that the leaders of the army, once they were sent into Europe, had very little contact or more or less no contact with Elizabeth, so they didn't necessarily do what she would have wanted them to do. So, uh, for a variety of reasons, but perhaps for those two main reasons, she was not successful in her support of Protestants in the Netherlands. She was not successful at that time in her support uh, for the Protestant king of France. And there were many problems with Ireland. Spain, of course, as a Catholic country and as an enemy of England, was allied with Ireland. So these countries were uh, working closely together. And uh, it, Ireland continued to be a Catholic country, whereas England had become a Protestant country, and the tension was becoming greater as the English continued to insist that Ireland belonged to them. In 1582, there was a, a, an uprising, an attempt at a, a revolution by the Irish, and after that, 30,000 Irish people, or about 30,000 people, died of starvation. Now, on the whole, we don't think of Elizabeth as a particularly cruel person. She, she didn't, for example, chop Mary's head off, Mary Queen of Scots' head off. Uh, she waited a long, long time until she felt she had no choice because Mary was cooperating with the uh, Catholics who were trying to kill Elizabeth. So in quite a lot of cases, we find Elizabeth to be, well, certainly a lot less bloody than her father, and perhaps, mm, in in general, less bloody, perhaps, than than Bloody Mary, so-called Bloody Mary, her half-sister, her Catholic half-sister. Although, things like this, 30,000 people dying of starvation in Ireland, and uh, quite a lot of rebellion in England, which was similarly brutal in its uh, repression. She did act very strictly against uh, both the English people on certain occasions and, and, and even more so against the Irish. And so when we think about that period, we have to consider that Elizabeth was responsible for the deaths of uh, an awful lot of people particularly Catholics. And the war in Ireland, the fighting in Ireland, went on uh, right up until uh, the time, pretty much the time of uh, Elizabeth's death. So her last years were marked by foreign wars. The other thing that marked her decline, uh, sorry, that marked her last years was um, a decline in her popularity. She was less popular during those last years for a number of reasons. One reason was because uh, there were still many Catholics in England and she was becoming stricter against those Catholics. In the beginning she had had to go a little bit carefully because probably at the beginning the majority of people favoured the Catholic religion, and so she had to go fairly gently in order to persuade people 
to join her church. But as time went on, more and more people joined her church and the Catholic uh, people became more uh, fringe, more of an extremist kind of thing in people's view. And so uh, she started to push harder and she became stricter against the Catholics. And the other thing that was going on at that time was uh, failure of crops. There were food shortages. There was social unrest. There were, there were problems. At a personal level too, Elizabeth had a bad time. She had a way of choosing pretty young men, handsome young men, uh, and making them into her favourites. And one such was Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, very much a favourite of hers. And he was foolish enough to think that he would get support for a rebellion against Elizabeth. And she tolerated most of his faults, but this, of course, was too much. And he was beheaded in 1601. She became very depressed over that and was heard to cry and bemoan the death of Robert Devereux, blaming herself sometimes, thinking that maybe if she had behaved differently, uh, there would have been a different result. So uh, she suffered personal depression and unhappiness and died finally in 1603, having already agreed that the next king was going to be James, that's the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and he was James the Sixth of Scotland, that he would be the next King of England after she died. Remember, she had no children, there were no more members of the Tudor family, and the Scottish Stuart family was the closest uh, relationship that she had. So it was decided that James would be the next King of England. So she was Queen for a very, very long time. And most English people couldn't remember a time when she hadn't been queen. So her death was an occasion for great national mourning and her tomb, like that of other English kings and queens, remains in Westminster Abbey.